So it's a pleasure for me to give a talk here. I have enjoyed the many good talks in this seminar. So today I will talk about a very classical subject, the Moser Trudinger or North inequality. So the first part of my talk will be uh, talking about some higher moment problem on this uh, sphere, two sphere. And this part is a joint work with uh, Fang Bao Han. And I hope I have time to go to the second part of the talk, and that's comparison of this inequality to same inequality of, in the Zico limit theorem. And this second part is a report of a joint work with Chang Feng Gui, and this work is still in progress. So let me start with the first part and the definitions. So the background is the following. So on a two sphere or the two manifold, a compact closed manifold, there is this a very former, famous Moser inequality, and which says if a function in two dimension is in W12, say W12, and then uh, it's actually the function itself may not be in L infinity class, but it is in this all its class of exponential L2 type. And not only so, Moser pointed out there's this sharp constant four pi. So this is the Moser inequality. And an immediate corollary of this inequality is uh, commonly nowadays known as moser trudinger inequality. So that's uh, to express this quadratic form into linear form. And then we get the volume of this E2W dVG log of that is bounded by one over four pi. This one over four pi is a sharp constant four pi, and then plus mean value, two mean value, and then plus a constant depending on the metric. Let me remark that this constant C2mg is always less than or equal to log of this C1mg. But this C1mg, easily one can test to see C1 is bigger than one. So if one derives the inequality here, the C2mg is always bigger than or equal to zero. So uh, uh, this uh, Moser's inequality was applied by Moser to study the prescribing Gaussian curvature problem, this famous problem of Nuremberg, and that's why this one over four pi is important. And later on, there is this uh, refinement of moser trudinger inequality when the manifold is the two sphere, and that is, uh, uh, is S2. So in that case, the Onofre shows in this case, this constant C2 is equal to zero. So the only difference with Onofre to Moser Schrodinger is this constant. So let me say a little bit of why Onofre is concerned about this constant. And Onofre's work is first based on this uh, uh, early work of Obang. Obang says that uh, this uh, if the function is in this symmetric class, symmetric class, okay, this symmetric class, then the constant is one half plus epsilon and plus some big constant, she epsilon. So uh, one improve the constant to one half plus epsilon by add C epsilon. And the motivation for Obang's inequality is the following. Why would Obang consider this metric in this symmetric class? And that's because on the two sphere, there is a natural energy, and that is not obvious. And that natural energy is the energy one over four pi gradient W squared plus two mean value of W. So this energy is colluvial energy. This is a conformally invariant energy. So what does that mean? That means if we have a conformal transformation from S2 to S2, and we map W to W composite with this conformal transformation and plus 
one half of its log to carbon, then this diluvial energy is invariant. Okay, so uh, this diluvial energy is invariant. And then one also knows that for each W, you can use one of these uh, conformal transformation W phi to transform T phi W to the symmetric class. So that motivate or bounce inequality. Okay, so now let me say that uh, Bonofi contribution is drop the epsilon and make T epsilon equal to zero in this or bounce inequality. Okay, in or bounce inequality. Or bounce inequality. So all no freeze inequality uh, was used to prove the extremum function of uh, this uh, Polyakov. That is, uh, it turns out this Liouville energy on the class of metric with volume one is uh, the difference of the log determinant of Laplacian minus log determinant of Laplace on standard metric. So a corollary of a bouncing inequality is this log determinant functional is extremized on the metric of the standard metric. Okay, so uh, we are talking about uh, uh, a bouncing inequality which move this Moses inequality, the constant A to one half in a symmetric class and then uh, Mm, uh, uh, for, for a to the to the uh, uh, one equal to one without the symmetric class. Okay, so now all bouncing equality we further improve all bouncing equality here. We further improve the uh, con the constant epsilon to c epsilon, but. We only switch it to say there exists an A less than one such that this is true. So let me say, all of the inequality says A equal to one without this constraint W in S1. Obang says A can be one half plus epsilon. But, I mean, sorry. This uh, one half plus epsilon, but on the other hand, what we have here is there is an A and without this constant C epsilon. So why are we interested in such a thing? Why improve this constant drop that C epsilon there? And that's because in this class now, one can see that this Liouville energy, which is the four energy plus two mean value, can be written, shift it by A to one plus A. And since on the class of volume equal to one, we know this first two, this thing is greater than equal to zero. So we bound the real W12 energy by the Liouville energy, okay? So, and this has the effect of a breaking symmetry. That is, uh, uh, we know that uh, uh, in general, uh, for standard bubble function, the energy could go to infinity and the mean value go to minus infinity. And so that the Liouville energy is bounded. So this, pro this inequality says that uh, if the, you move the metric to the symmetric class, then the energy is bounded by the Liouville energy. So that's the motivation of concerning about these various constants. Okay, okay. And now in view of our work, the CY work, and there's a further concern of what is the best A for this inequality to hold. And in view of our bound, the guess should be A equal to one half but we were not able to prove it. And this turns out to be a very hard problem to crack the best constant A. And there is a series of work done by Gui Changfeng, Gui Gongsu, C.S. Lin, and Wei over the years for very special case. 
And there's this result last year, finally cracked by Gui and the Muradi firm. Okay, so it really shows the best concern in this inequality is one health for W in the symmetric cuts. Okay, so that's the starting point of uh, our discussion. So in general, what I'm saying is, without constraint, the best constant is one. With constraint, the best constant is one health. Okay, and now let me state uh, some new results. Okay. So to motivate the study of this new result, we recall some parallel program going on on this one sphere. Okay, one on circle. And that's the classical median Lebedev inequality. So let me recall the, the median Lebedev inequality, which says if a function is defined on the circle, then this EU, this L1 norm, is bounded by its H1 health norm. So in terms of H1 health norm means uh, this uh, Dirichlet norm of its harmonic extension. So the Dirichlet norm gradient u squared dx dy is equal to u times du d normal. So this uh, right hand side is the H1 health norm of S1. And that's the sharp inequality of million Lebedev. This inequality is a very useful inequality. What it really says is if one consider e to the u over two and the Fourier coefficient is bk, and then if the harmonic extension of Fourier coefficient is ak, then one can compute, com bound the sum of bk squared log of that by k times ak squared. And so this compare the Fourier coefficient of the exponential function with its shock, and it's very useful in numerical analysis and in the study of univalent functions. In particular, it's used in the study of a, to solve the Bieberbach conjecture. So that's median Lebedev inequality. But after the work of Mini Lebedev, it turns out there is a series, a string of inequalities by Grenada and Ziegel, and which we will describe briefly in part two if I have time. And they are studying determinants of topless metric. And let me just say the inequality generalizes median Lebedev inequality. It's a string of monotonic inequality and generalizing median Lebedev. And what concerns us now is it turns out this string of inequality of Grenado Zigo has a following corollary, which was pointed out by Horowitz in 1988. So what Whedon has pointed out is if u is in, I can say, h1 health, h1 health of s1, and if its first m moment is zero, then one further improve the median number inequality to the constant one over m plus one, and this inequality is sharp. And the m equal to one case of this inequality was independently proved by Oscar Philip Sarnak, and that's why Horowitz Whedon wants to point it out that this is a consequence of uh, Ziegel's inequality. And Oscar Philip Sarnak, of course, used this to, uh, it's an important inequality in them in the study of isospectral problem of compact surfaces. Okay, so what concerns us if we look at this inequality on S1, when m equal to 1, that coincides with the result of Gi and Moradifan on S2. So we also get one health if the function is perpendicular to the first eigenfunctions. So that raises the question on S2, are there all are there also string inequalities like uh, Ziegel's 
inequality or like the inequality pointed out by Whedon. So this is the statement of the result. Okay, so let's back to S2 and we consider spherical harmonics of degree K. So this is the eigenspace of uh, minus Laplace on S2 with eigenvalue K times K plus one. So this is the spherical harmonics. And it turns out for each M, we define a number called Nm. So what is Nm? Nm is the minimum number of N so that for each P, which is in the uh, span of this M's spherical harmonics, including M equal to zero, then this P, the mass of P can be evaluated at n points on S2. So there exists n points on S2. The integration of P is captured by P of Ci i mu i with some positive number mu one to mu n. So that's the number n m. So let's look at uh, what does n m really say. So when m equal to zero, if p is uh, in h zero, so that means p is a constant function, then we only need one point to capture the mean value of p because that's the constant. So n zero is equal to one. But let's to take a look at uh, m equal to one. So if a function is in span of uh, zeros and the first spherical harmonic is written as C plus summation Ci Xi. So Xi is the coordinate function X1, X2, X3. But one can also think about it as a point on sphere. So P is equal to C plus summation Ci Xi. And then P at North Pole is C plus C3. So my X3 is a, a North Pole. 100 zero zero is North Pole. And P at South Pole is C minus C3. So that means in order to capture this uh, mean value of P or the mass of P, we only need to add those two, North Pole plus South Pole divided by two. So that means N2 is, e N1 is equal to two, okay. So, and then it's already non-trivial to see that uh, when M equal to two, what is N2? What is N2? N2, okay. So it turns out N2 equal to four. So that means in this case, P is in the span of H0, H1, and H2, which is of dimension nine. And you only need four points to capture its mean value. And that's, uh, these four points are the vertex of the regular tetrahedron. And in general, this NN is well studied and there's a strange name called Kubacher in scientific computing. And there's a lot of work in this uh, numerical analysis and there is a handy book, a volume handy book. The best we can tell is uh, when M is large, there's no precise uh, formula for NM. The best uh, thing we can tell is it's greater than M over two, the greatest integer plus one square. So in particular, Nm tends to infinity as M tends to infinity. So what I have done is I define this Nm. And now the statement of the theorem uh, with Han, uh, myself and uh, Hong Bao Han is the following. We say that if this mass E to U is perpendicular to the spherical harmonics, so not including K equal to zero, and we call U in SM is symmetric in that sense, then indeed one improve this um, 
almost treating the inequality by one over Nm. Okay. So when m equal to one, n one equal to two. So if e to u is uh, in a symmetric class S one, we recover or bounce inequality. But uh, uh, if one look at the uh, original or bounce proof, it's uh, uh, quite a difficult proof because he used covering argument. He cover uh, the sphere by the eigenfunctions xi, the mass of xi. And if you think about how to generalize his proof to other case when m is greater than one, it's quite difficult. We don't know how to distribute this eigenfunction, the mass of the second eigenfunction. So our proof is more general and uh, with a different proof of our bounce lemma. And now the second remark is, this result is actually in spirit uh, very similar to the early work of Marchioti. Marchioti's work says that if the mass of E2W is distributed, is uh, uh, somehow distributed in n parts, there are n points with mass greater than a portion of this total mass, then the best constant in the inequality should be one over n. Okay, so uh, our statement is in spirit similar to that. What we have pointed out is if this E2U is in this uh, span perpendicular in this SM class, the distribution of points of the mass is Nm. Okay, and now, uh, so that's our theorem. So uh, let me say a few more words about the statement of the theorem. It turns out this Nm is the best constant in this inequality in the sense we do not, we were not able to move the epsilon, but we are saying that suppose you have a constant lambda such that this inequality holds for all W in Sm, then this constant is bigger than or equal to 1m. Okay, and this is uh, by constructing a precise testing function. And the proof of this part is actually the hardest part of the uh, theorem. So Om is best in this constant. And now, uh, of course, a natural question to ask is in view of the work of GM, it's natural to ask, can we also in this inequality drop the epsilon and the C epsilon to zero? And which turns out to be quite difficult because uh, when M is bigger than one, they introduce a lot of Lagrange multiplier for the Euler equation. And when M equal to one, one can kill those lot coefficient of this Lagrange multiplier by custom Warner condition. And for M is bigger than one, one does not know how to cancel those Lagrange multipliers. Nevertheless, when M equal to two, we manage to shift the constant a little bit. The optimum constant, remember N2 equal to two, N2 equal to four. So in this case, one is by one over 16 pi. But on the other hand, we manage to get it down below one half minus delta. Okay, so one half, remember, is for functions in S1. And so if we have functions in S2, we should be lower. And even this inequality was proved based on the uniqueness result of Lenghi and the Moradin fund. Okay, and so we test our method back to S1. So on S1, it turns out the corresponding constant Nm is indeed M plus one. And if we, we can, our inequality says this one over M plus one plus epsilon and so on. But in this case, because this is the corresponding Euler Lagrange equation is a Dirichlet problem with boundary. So this D is the boundary, S1 is the boundary of D. We managed to cancel the Lagrange multiplier 
and shows that the inequality can be sharpened by dropping epsilon and C epsilon. So this method does recapture Whedon's uh, remark about this, uh, this string of uh, Zico inequality. Okay, but uh, in general, we are not able to drop this epsilon and C epsilon. So since this is a seminar talk, I think I should uh, uh, say a little bit about the proof of the theorem. The proof of this theorem, so I'm talking about this theorem uh, uh, of myself with uh, Von Bauhan, is a, a refinement of the argument of Leon's concentration compactness argument. So let me briefly describe uh, what we have done. So if we give a sequence of ui in H1, say, let me say it's mean value zero, and it's uh, energy bounded by one. And then ui tends to u weakly in H1. So our strategy is now we see, look at the mass of this uh, uh, sigma. So gradient ui tends to gradient u squared plus Sigma, sigma is a measure, in measure. So let's look at this measure. So the first observation is the following. If K is a compact, this part of lemma is actually work on any M2, but in particular, if K is a compact subset on the sphere and the mass sigma K is less than one, then one apply Moser's original inequality to show that this, you can improve the original inequality to four pi p times u i squared. So most of says four pi u i squared is bounded. Here we say u pi p u i squared is bounded for some p less than one over sigma k and for constant independent of i. So if one sees that, then uh, if one consider the soup of sigma, this uh, measure sigma, if I call it kappa zero, if kappa zero is less than one, then that means uh, sigma of the whole sphere is mass is uh, uh, less than one, and we can create this p greater than one here. One can show four pi u i square tends to four pi u square in L one. So that's a consequence. But if kappa zero is indeed equal to one, one can use previous argument to see that indeed it's only have one point of concentration, sigma equal to sigma x naught. And uh, the weak limit of this sequence ui now is uh, equal to zero identically equal to zero. And then four pi ui squared tends to one plus c zero delta x zero. So given this uh, lemma, given this lemma, we begin to prove the theorem, proceed the proof of the theorem by contradiction. So that means if our u is in SM, this symmetric class. And suppose this inequality does not hold. This e to u less than alpha greater than u squared plus c epsilon is does not hold. Then there exists a sequence vi such that this log, this mass minus alpha greater than ui squared tends to infinity because there's no c epsilon. And if it goes to infinity, Moses' original inequality already says this first term is bounded by one times gradient ui. So that means this energy already tends to infinity and the log term also go to infinity. So we have two terms, both go to infinity. So we begin to normalize it, denote the uh, the energy by mi and ui equal to vi divided by mi. So we reach the following situation. We have a sequence ui 
such that this exponential to mi ui minus alpha mi square tends to infinity. Okay, and this uh, each term tends to infinity. And the following proposition says that uh, if we now look at the mass of E gradient ui dv and compare this sigma to the concentration of this exponential function, we can relate sigma to mu in the following sense in this situation. That is, we begin to look at the points where this sigma x is greater than four pi alpha, and then use the previous lemma, we can conclude this sigma consists of at most n points, say consists of uh, discrete n points. And this mass mu now is actually a distribution of mu i del cosi i with summation mu i equal to one. So this proposition is uh, uh, not so easy to understand, but uh, it's a refinement of the argument in the lemma. So given that, then we have, uh, if our mu i is in, uh, this uh, vi is originally in SM, in SM, in SM, then for each phi j in this uh, span, we have this summation phi j is equal to zero. So that means this four pi alpha, each is uh, points where sigma is greater than four pi alpha. So we have n points, so four pi alpha n is less than or equal to one. So by our definition, this n must be greater than or equal to nm because nm is the smallest integer this holds. And so alpha is less than or equal to four pi nm which is a contradiction because originally we take alpha to be equal to four pi nm plus epsilon. So uh, that is the proof. So the proof in summary is a refinement of uh, uh, some argument of uh, Pierre Lyon, but, uh, but, Lyon, but uh, we look at the uh, uh, apply to this uh, setting of uh, the soft, uh, the Moser's uh, uh, version, okay? Apply to Moser's inequality. So that uh, conclude my first part of the talk. So let me briefly say what's the second part. Okay. The second part is uh, recall I have mentioned that Whedon has pointed out the sharp inequality are consequence of the original grenado zigo inequality on topless determinants. What are the original inequality? So what that means is if f is in L1 of S1 and we do look at its case Fourier coefficient, one begin to talk about uh, the topless form of f and that is the metric with coefficient c i minus j. And if we chop it at m, call it Tm. So this is m plus one cross m plus one in uh, matrix. So T0 is C0, T1 is C0, C0, C1, C minus one. And C2 is uh, this inequality, C0 on the diagonal C1, C minus one, and C2, C minus two. And determinant of Dn of F denote determinant of this, uh, I'm sorry, I should use M, DM, okay. So DM of F is determinant of this topless form, M plus one cross M plus one. So the Zico limit theorem says this, if U is in H1 half of S1, then one look at its determinant and minus mean value of U, this is, monotonically increase to the energy, okay? So M equal to zero virgin is the Lebedev median inequality. So when M equal to one, let's look at what this inequality says. Then in this case, 
because we are talking about EU to be real value function. So uh, this uh, C minus one bar is uh, C minus one is C one bar. So we get this inequality, the integration of EU square minus its first Fourier coefficient C one square minus two mean value of U is less than the energy. So in the special case, when this U is already in this S1 class, then we do get this two square here, take out, we get the original inequality, mean value, log mean of this integration U minus mean value. Now, there is this square, so we have one half of the energy. So we capture this one half. So this is the fact pointed out by, by Whedon. And he actually pointed out you have string of inequality for each M. So looking at this inequality, then the question one asks is, is there a string of inequality on S2 like Ziegel's limit theorem? Okay, is there an analog on S2? And this, of course, is a hard problem, and we really have not even to crack the case when m equal to two. But there is this uh, partial progress uh, made by uh, Gui and I, and what uh, we have done is the following. We say that in view of this, uh, 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 this uh, uh, inequality on S1 of the first moment, one, a natural inequality may be to consider the energy square minus the, uh, its center, okay, square, the weight, and minus four mean value, and ask what's the best constant beta so that this inequality holds. So, for example, when beta equal to two, we know the inequality holds by Moser, I mean by, by Onofre. So when beta equal to two, the inequality holds. If this beta were one, the best constant were one, then we recapture the result of uh, G and M because uh, the, this square make this uh, beta equal to one. Uh, after divide by one, by two, we get one half. So one was hoping this more general inequality actually is sharp at beta equal to one. And it turns out to our surprise, this, the result of this answer is no, and the best constant beta in this inequality beta is equal to four third, and it is sharp. And it is sharp. We actually have function which attend this uh, four third. So uh, let me say a little bit about how do we see that. We look at uh, uh, the inequality, which is the right-hand side minus the left-hand side in the previous inequality. We notice when beta equal to two, this J beta is greater than or equal to zero. And we manage to say that for each beta bigger than one, this J beta is greater than beta minus four third, the energy. And when beta equal to four third, this is greater than equal to zero. But in general, for each beta less than four third, this functional is not bounded from below. Okay, so uh, beta equal to two is bounded from below, but uh, once get stuck at four third. So let me just say one word about uh, how to, how does the proof go? The proof is interesting in the following sense. We denote this uh, center E to WXI, the moment AI by this and with volume one. So what we do is we begin to look at the Euler-Lagrange equation of J beta. And then it turns out that uh, this uh, uh, equation satisfy the Euler equation is the following form. And in this form, this PDE, again, we play with Kurt Stone-Warner. 
And to our surprise, we find that for each beta between one and two, the uh, Euler equation AI drops, AI equal to zero. And then one can apply GM to C, W equal to zero is the only solution. But at beta equal to four third, we do have the, the AI is not dropping. So this uh, equation, the argument fails at four equal to four third. But if I examine this PDE closely, one notice that for each center, there exists a unique solution of this Euler Lagrange equation. And one actually, by some magic, one can actually precisely write down what is the solution. The solution is this WA. This WA is a function on the two sphere, is uh, uh, the mass, the center is at A, and it's this equation, minus two third. And then if you pull back to show this WA and it's, uh, into the PDE, into the functional, then it's equal to zero. And then if one vary this WA by this parameter, beta two over beta, so when beta equal to four over three, this is three over two, we pull this. And then one can test to see this J beta tends to minus infinity. And it turns out that uh, by some, based on early work of G and M, not the work where they proved the sharp constant one half, and early work, one can use symmetric argument to say this WA is actually the unique one with its center at the point A. So, and that says that not only you have a extreme function, you have a series of them, and then, uh, that's the sharp inequality. Uh, there are other work in GM, which are, I mean, in my work with G, which are still going on. Okay. So let me finish my talk by saying that we are continuing searching the right functional J, and which is uh, the uh, parallel inequality of z limit theorem for the second stage. We are still making effort. But in general, it seems to be an ambitious program to ask if there is a Ziegel limit theorem on S2. Okay. And actually, the problem could make more sense on three sphere instead of two sphere, because in the original uh, Ziegel limit theorem, they treat S1 as the boundary of the disk. So if one trick treat S3 as the boundary of B4 and maybe in CR geometry or in other Kähler cases metric, one can try to see if there's an analog of z limit theorem, but this is an ambitious program. And the last remark I want to make is, uh, nevertheless, the technique developed uh, in the paper with Han seems to be much more flexible and can deal with other type of inequality involving the limiting type Sobloff embedding theorem. And for example, the case when the energy is a gradient U to the nth power has independently worked out by Han. Okay. Again, the key point is one does not use covering lemma argument, but use this uh, concentration compactness argument. So I'd like to thank you for your attention.